Our scripture reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. In this series about our spiritual ancestors, we've tried to take time each week to sort of set the tone with a video, a, a form of music that can connect us to the time and place of the person that we'll be talking about. So today's example is chant. Chant is defined as a short musical passage in two or more phrases used for singing unmetered words. In other words, it's a form of music very different from what you've already seen today, the kind of music that we usually use today. It probably originated in the church with the Psalms, which were meant to be sung originally. Uh, we have very few surviving examples of liturgies from the 5th century, the time period that we'll be talking about today. But they would have chanted Psalms and other lyrics together. Today's example is Gregorian chant, which developed in the 8th century. It comes from the Benedictine monks of Santo Domingo de Silos in northern Spain. Now, it can seem hard to connect to not only musically but lyrically because it's in Latin. The Latin will say, Hec dies quam fecit dominis, dominus, which, of course, doesn't mean anything to most of us. But if we know where it comes from, it will. It's from Psalm 118.24. They're saying, in translation, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. So keep that in your mind. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And see if your prayer, your worship, can resonate with people from more than a thousand years ago. Let's pray as we open God's Word. Lord, we know that people in your world have been praising you, being shaped by you for longer than our history records. But we're grateful for the things that we do still have left, for the connecting points between your followers at other times and those of us who are trying to follow you today. Help us to see today another glimpse of the breadth of your kingdom so that you can inspire us and shape us as you continue to move forward. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Today, we continue in our new series, 
The Great Cloud of Witnesses, a study of our spiritual ancestors. We're looking back at the lives of some of the people who've gone before us in the Christian faith in hopes that in seeing how Christ worked in and through them, we can discover new ways for Him to work in and through us. Today we come to the third person on our list, St. Benedict. As we said at the beginning, five of the nine people on our list were monks, including Benedict. But Benedict would become in some ways the most beloved and revered monk by almost all the other monks that came after him in the Western world. And the reason why will be our main focus for today. But before we get to that, a little about Benedict's life. He was born in 480 AD, just four years after the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West, in the little Italian village of Nursia. So sometimes you'll hear, see him called Benedict of Nursia. As a young man of about 20, he traveled to Rome to be educated, but he wasn't there long. He found that the moral corruption of both the academy and the church and the city were too much for him. He knew he would never be able to find God there. So he left the city and eventually decided to become a hermit. And after meeting another monk who instructed him, Benedict decided to become a monk or a hermit himself and live in a cave near the town of Subiaco. Today there's a monastery built there, but they've preserved the cave where Benedict lived for three years. So at first, Benedict was similar to Anthony of Egypt. He sought to find God in solitude and simplicity. So he, like Anthony, was an anchorite, which comes from a Greek word meaning to withdraw. He had removed himself from the rest of the world so that he could be alone with God. But somehow, Benedict's spiritual quest became known in the surrounding area. Because after about three years, he was approached by a nearby monastery to become their abbot. The previous abbot, the elected leader of the monastery, had died. And they wanted Benedict to come and lead them because they respected him so much. His holy living and his devotion to God. However, it didn't end up working out too well. Apparently, life in a monastery differed from place to place. Some monks lived by very strict rules, with every particular part of their daily routines being narrowly prescribed. What they ate and drank, when they prayed, what work they did, when they slept, everything. In other monasteries, it was more relaxed. Some had very few rules at all. Benedict seemed to know that his style of living probably wasn't going to mesh too well with the monks who were asking him to be their abbot. He favored a more regimented life while they were used to being more lax. But he eventually agreed to their request and became their abbot. Well, apparently, Benedict's first instincts were right. Because after he'd been there a while and instituted some more rigid standards of behavior... The monks there tried to poison him. In his time as well as ours, that is a sign that things are not going very well. So he went back to the cave. But then over time, he went on to found 12 different monasteries, including the most famous at Monte Cassino. This is how it looks today. It's been built and enlarged many times since Benedict founded it in 529. But the most significant thing about this monastery is not its size or how old it is, it's what happened there. It was for this monastery that Benedict wrote the rule of St. Benedict. And that, more than anything else, is why he is famous today. Like we said, up until then, there were lots of different ways to live a monastic life. There had been previous attempts at written standards. Some were very strict. Others were very open with lots of variation from one to the next. But what Benedict managed to do was to create a rule that was both specific enough to give meaningful structure and yet flexible and versatile enough to be used at many different times and in many different places. Within a few generations, his rule, his collection of guidelines for monastic life, became the most widely used in the West. And even now, 1,500 years later, 
it's still the basis of the vast majority of Christian monastic communities around the world. So, what's so special about Benedict's way of doing things? One thing that set Benedict's rule apart from previous attempts at creating standards for Christian livings was his source. Before Benedict, most Christian writers were heavily dependent on what they called classical literature, the writings of ancient Greek and Roman philosophers. But Benedict chose to base his rule solely on another source, the Bible. In 73 short chapters, Benedict quotes the Bible 126 times, and he doesn't quote anything else. In other words, in his rule, he was trying to answer the same question that all Christians ask. How can my life be patterned after the ways of God? Or we could say it this way. How can I live like Jesus? Jesus loved and obeyed God. He lived his life in fellowship with God, in keeping with the spirit of God's love. And that's what he calls us to do. So, how can we do that? Because it's not as simple as some people suppose. People often think, that, think of the Bible as an instruction book for living. You ever heard people use the, the acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth? Like that's what the Bible is, Basic Instructions for How to Live Our Lives. Is that what Scripture really is? Sort of. Are there important truths and principles found in the Bible? Yes. Can we gain an understanding of the values of God from the Bible? Definitely. Will the Bible tell you what to do explicitly in every circumstance? No, not at all. That's just not how the Bible works. Instead, we have to take all the truth and wisdom and values that we find in Scripture and somehow figure out a way to apply it to our unique life situation. That's what Benedict was doing with his rule, adapting the life of Jesus to his unique situation. In other words, even though Jesus was not a monk, Benedict still felt that the life of Jesus could be instructive for the life of monks. Isn't that the same situation in which we find ourselves? Think about it. There are a lot of outward differences between Jesus' life situation and ours. For instance, Jesus was not married. Jesus did not have children. He didn't live in the time that we do. Jesus didn't have your job. He didn't use our technology. He never faced many of the issues that we face today. But does that mean that we have no way of living like Jesus? Of course not. It just means that living like Jesus today is going to require some careful thinking. We're going to have to adapt the life of Jesus to our unique life situation. By the way, this is not just an intellectual process. It's a spiritual process. If you have put your faith in Christ, then Christ's spirit is alive in you. In other words, Jesus is facing all the life situations that you encounter. He's doing it in you, which means he will help you in each choice that you have to make. But as you attempt to imitate the life of Jesus in your own time and place, aren't you glad that you aren't the first person who's ever tried it? If there was someone else who had thought through what adapting Jesus' life means, and they had written it all down in a systematized way, wouldn't you be grateful for the help? For myself, I need all the help I can get. The rule of St. Benedict has been helping people, not just monks, but Christians of all kinds, for 1,500 years. So I think we should take a look and see how it might help us. The book consists of a prologue and 73 chapters. The prologue is actually one of the longest sections, and it's only about a page and a half. Most of the chapters are much shorter than that. So what is it about? 
It's basically advice for living a spiritually intentional life. Again, it was specifically designed for life in a monastery, so there are some things that might not apply directly to our lives. For instance, chapter 9 is entitled, How Many Psalms Are to Be Said at the Night Office? The monks prayed together eight times every day. They called it praying the offices. And there were certain psalms used at certain times. Chapter 31 is, The kind of man the cellarer of the monastery ought to be. This was the person in charge of all the food and drink. So Benedict gives instructions about the qualities this person will need and how he should relate to his fellow monks in the course of his duties. Here's a quote. If a brother should perchance request anything of him unreasonably, let him not sadden the brother with a cold refusal, but politely and with humility refuse him who asketh amiss. In other words, this person might have to say, no, you can't have any extra wine, brother but he should say it in a kind way, right? So there are some things in the rule that might seem pretty foreign to a modern non-monastic reader, but there are quite a few things that are very relevant to the life of faith in every time and place. For instance, chapter 4 is about the instruments of good works. It's a long list with lots of scripture references of the kinds of things God wants us to do. Here's what it means, says Benedict, in general, to be a follower of Jesus. In the first place, to love the Lord God with the whole heart, the whole soul, the whole strength. Then, one neighbor as oneself. Then, not to kill, not to commit adultery, not to steal. You recognize some of the things from Scripture there. To honor all men. Benedict was insistent that no worldly standards of status should ever be observed in the Christian community. It doesn't matter how important your family was or how rich they were or how poor they were or the fact that nobody's ever heard of them. None of that matters. All people are equally valued in the eyes of God. To relieve the poor, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick, to bury the dead, to console the sorrowing. Jesus calls us to do the same things that he's done. To prefer nothing to the love of Christ. To speak the truth with heart and tongue. To do no injury, yea, even to bear patiently with the injury done us. Not to be given to wine. Not to be a great eater. Not to be a detractor. To desire eternal life with all spiritual longing. To keep death before one's eyes daily. To dash at once against Christ the evil thoughts which rise in one's heart. Not to love much speaking. I might get in trouble with that one. To apply oneself often to prayer. Not to love strife. Not to love pride. To honor the aged to love the younger. And the last one is probably my favorite. And never to despair of God's mercy. In this life we live trying to follow Jesus, are we ever going to mess up? Yes. Are we ever going to mess up really bad? Yes. But even in those moments, should we ever doubt that God can forgive us and make us whole? Benedict says, not for one second. Never to despair of God's mercy. So the rule starts off with a wonderful list of what acting like Jesus looks like. Then in chapters 5 through 7, Benedict lays out his three most basic principles. Chapter 5 is obedience. Chapter 6, silence. Chapter 7, humility. How often do these three virtues come up in your idea of what being a Christian means. Unfortunately, sometimes we tend to leave all of them out completely. Of these three, obedience, silence, and humility, which one is probably the least appealing to most of us? Obedience. I wonder, is that why Benedict lists it first? Benedict believed that obedience was an essential part of humility, which is an essential part of following Jesus. 
He says as much in the opening sentence of verse 5. The first degree of humility is obedience without delay. This becometh those who hold nothing dearer than Christ. In other words, when God tells you to do something, do it. Now, in Benedict's case, writing for monks in a monastery, obedience had wider implications than just doing what God says. It also meant doing what your superiors in the monastery said, the abbot and the other leaders. Submitting one's life to God meant you also submit to other people in lots of ways. So, does that concept still apply to us? Does following Jesus mean that we will submit to others? Let me just warn you, we're about to get very personal and potentially controversial. But you know, sometimes that's part of following Jesus too. The answer is yes. Being a Christian means that we not only submit to Jesus, but also to others out of obedience to Him. In Ephesians, before... Paul lays out what's sometimes called his household code, how we should treat one another in the interconnected relationships that bind us all together. In the very first verse of that section, he gives his basic governing principle for the whole thing. Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That idea that we will all be called to defer to one another, to submit, will be present in every relationship of life. In Ephesians 5, it covers spouses, parents and children, even masters and servants. Every person in every relationship will be called upon to submit to others some of the time. Let me say, this has never been one of the more popular ideas of the Christian faith. As Americans, with our history of an emphasis on personal freedom, we may have a harder time than most. But really, just as human beings, usually our default position is, no one can tell me what to do. Right? That's just how we feel most of the time. No one can tell me what to do. But here's the problem. That, at, that attitude may be very American, but it's not very Christian. A minister friend of mine calls it the idolatry of individualism. The idolatry of individualism. The attitude that my ideas about everything are always authoritative, period. Again, that might be very American, but it's not very Christian. Instead, as followers of Jesus, the Bible says... Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, you know who can tell us what to do? Jesus. And he wants us to submit to one another. I've noticed something, especially recently, and maybe you have too. It's a sign that we're not really doing very well when it comes to submitting to one another. I've noticed that we seem to have abandoned the concept of expertise. Here's what I mean. I would never attempt to build my own house. Even if I could save a lot of money, I just wouldn't do it. Why? Because I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no training. I have no experience. I can barely hammer a nail without bending it. Half the time it ends up getting messed up. So if I tried to build a house, I'm pretty sure it would either fall apart or catch on fire, or both. Now the bad plumbing might put out the fire, but I'm saying it's a bad idea. If I needed a house built, I would definitely choose to defer to someone with expertise. And there are lots of things like that. I wouldn't attempt to write my own will in the legal sense, or to prescribe my own medication, or even to cut my own hair. You can find some sad examples online of some people who have said, how hard can it be to cut my own hair? Go to the pictures. So there are lots of things that we readily admit require expertise. But then there are other times, maybe even bigger times, when we seem to ignore it altogether. 
For instance, there are quite a few people right now acting as if expertise doesn't matter at all when it comes to COVID-19. It's like somehow we're all equally trained in epidemiology. You hear it every day. Masks don't really work. There can't be that many cases out there. It can't really spread that much. Sometimes we act like all opinions on the matter are equally valid. But really? They're not. There are people who have studied and trained their whole adult lives in this area. What they think matters more than what I think. The truth is, but for those experts, we would never even have heard of COVID-19 until it was too late. It's not just a medical issue or a social issue or a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. Will we have the humility to listen to people who know more than we do? I think Benedict was right. Obedience is an essential part of humility, which is an essential part of following Jesus. There are lots of other meaningful insights that Benedict gives us about the nature of faith, especially how to live and conduct ourselves within the community of faith. We've got time for one more. Chapter 3 in the Rule of St. Benedict is entitled, Of Calling the Brethren for Counsel. It's about how important decisions should be made within the monastery. In Benedict's plan, it's the abbot who should make the final decision. He says that the abbot should make sure to consult carefully, though, with all the other monks. In describing this process, Benedict says something that might be surprising to modern readers. Whenever weighty matters are to be transacted in the monastery, let the abbot call together the whole community and make known the matter which is to be considered. Having heard the brethren's views, let him weigh the matter with himself and do what he thinketh best. It is for this reason, however, we said that all should be called for counsel, because the Lord often revealeth to the younger what is best. Benedict wanted to make sure that the leaders of the monasteries didn't just listen to the old hands, people who've been there a long time. They needed to listen to everyone, even to the guy who just got there last week. Why? Because you never can tell where God might be speaking. What did the Apostle Paul write to Timothy? Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Paul and Benedict seem to be saying the same thing. Sometimes God speaks through the younger generation. Is that a word that we could stand to hear in today's church? How often do we worry that the church is only one or two generations away from dying? If we were all here in the sanctuary today and we looked around, what would be the average age of our congregation? I'll give you a hint. It's not 35. So how do we reach out and include the younger generations in the life and ministry of the church? Could it be by giving them a voice? Listening to what God is saying in their lives? I think that's what Benedict and Paul would say. But here's the thing. I don't know exactly what the 30 to 45 year olds in our church would say. What they're hearing from God what's important to them, what they think our priorities in ministry should be. But I do know this. Their answers to those questions are likely to be very different than what our 60 to 75-year-olds would say. Now, that shouldn't surprise us if you're in that older age group. When you were 30 years old, did you have any different ideas from the people who came before you? Sure. Sure. That's just how generations work. And according to Benedict, sometimes that's how God works. So new generations having new ideas shouldn't surprise us. The question is, will it scare us? 
Will those of us who've been in the church longer, frankly, who've been in the world longer, will we insist that things continue to be done our way? Or will we make room for the voices of the next generations? Because if we won't, if there's no room for their voices, for their ideas, what that really means is there's no room for them. Sometimes God speaks through the younger generation. Humility is an essential part of faith. And that means we have to make room in our hearts and in the church for everyone's voice. The rule of St. Benedict can be strange to us because our time and place is so different from his. But the main thing I think we can learn from it is what Paul told us in our scripture for today. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach to others... I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The life of faith is not simple. It's not easy. It requires discipline. As Paul said, strict training. So, do you have rules for your own life? What are they? Where do they come from? Do you have specific spiritual disciplines in your life that help you prefer nothing to the love of Christ? Is it time for you to reevaluate your disciplines? To look outside yourself? To look outside your normal routine? To find a better way to live? A better way to follow Christ? It might be something from the rule of St. Benedict or it might be something else. But whatever we do, May we never despair of God's mercy and may we run in such a way as to get the prize. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that this life of faith is something that you have never called us to do alone. We not only have the people surrounding us in the community of faith today, but really we're connected to all the people who've ever trusted you and all of those who ever will. Help us to pull from all the gifts that you give us. Show us wisdom wherever we find it. And show us how you're alive and how you're acting in the people around us, the people who've gone before us, so that we can find those ways that help us to be faithful, to hold nothing dearer than your love. We ask it in your name. Amen.